Okay, uh, here we go. We are live on the podcast. I, I, just before we get into introducing our guest, Cam Kilgore, um, I just want to say that this, the video version of Please Blow My Mind is, is an Audiana TV exclusive. I've made that call. I have stopped uploading the video to YouTube and, and, and to the internet because I think, I think it's time to give our people some exclusive material, you know, and, and I really do mean that as a, as something special because, because I heard something this week and, and it really resonated with me um, imagine if I never came to you Cam and you were just sitting there for an hour that'd be hilarious we'll be we'll be with you in a second Cam uh, I heard something this week which is like stop going after a million people with you know social media and all these things you know find an audience of 1,000 true fans and and do that and and I think there's a lesson in that for for many of us you know like I look at stadiums and, and rugby and sports arenas and if they got 1,000 people everyone will be annoyed you know but if you had 1,000 true people on your team that's a goal worth going towards so I guess as a segue the person who is joining us on the podcast this week has about a thousand true fans Cam Kilgo welcome to please blow my mind my brother Aloha, Willie. Aloha. <laughs> no, no, no. It's Kiorana. That's right. <laughs> uh, Malo Lele. Hola. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what's up? Like to go? Cam, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Cam, many of the audience are looking, thinking, who's this dude? And that's a very good question. Let's let let's wait to talk about from, this stuff. I'm from Penryn. I'm from Penryn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Going to the to the Cook Island community that um, I am. Penryn, deep <laughs> down in my heart and my soul, I am from Penryn. Panthers. Oh, yeah, sharks actually. <laughs> Lots of sharks up in Penryn. True that. Have you actually been back to Penrith? Penrith. Yeah, where are you talking about? Pen Penryn in the Cook Islands. Oh. <laughs> That's how well I know the Cook Islands. I thought you were saying Penrith. So the nor northernmost island in the Cook Islands is well, Penrith. There you go. I've just um, been I've just been schooled. Yeah, so don't ever call me white again. Um, <laughs> there are fifteen islands in the Cook Islands, best islands in the Pacific. Uh, uh, Otaki has been voted the uh, yeah has been voted the best island in the Pacific for the last ten years, I think. And mm. um, yeah, fantastic people, um, such warm, kind-hearted, work hard people. And uh, yeah, Penryn is the 15th and the, the most northern island, and it's a beautiful, beautiful island. I've actually never been, but uh, the Penryn community took me in and said that I was from Penryn. So uh, I love I love the people from Penryn. Cam, before we talk about your involvement with Cook Island Rugby and, and the Pacific uh, Rugby in general, um, what is your... I thought you said Penrith because I know you have kind of a, an Australian background, heritage and stuff. Have you gone back to to search where your origins start? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I. But someone asked me the other day, what you know, especially with what's going on, you know, where you come from, what what uh, what do you go by? I guess, which is um, unusual. But I, I'm a half Pakeha, half Australian. Um, so yeah, half New Zealander, half Australian. My dad's a New Zealander. My mum's Australian. Um, my mum's family uh, is an O'Malley o O'Malley family, so they're from Ireland mm -hmm. originally. And uh, and then my dad's uh, family is from Scotland originally. So um, both Scottish and Irish people were treated very very poorly by the British, um, and uh, they've um, you know they've suffered huge. Um, issues and and been um treated very very poorly in the past as well so um i'm not saying i i'm not saying that uh that i know what it's like um at all but i'm just saying that um you know you you, you ask you look deep into your family's past and your mm -hmm. history and and uh yeah there's a lot of wrongdoings to a lot of people though so a lot of uh um people all around the world i guess um yeah yeah it's a, look and and time. and and I do believe that, you know, well, I think long term, 
we need to really confront things. And look, it's tricky. Should we just say that? Because you're not sure what to say, when to say it. And, and, and the world is designed in a funny way at the moment where it's it's not that easy to actually say things without kind of uh, potentially offending somebody. So so where I go to with this is I start looking within, right? I start thinking about how do, when the world calls on me, maybe it's the podcast, maybe it's me being part of the family, how do I be the best I can be? Um, you know, in those type of things, Cam, and you've been around the rugby circles for a little while, do you think the scenario let's say professionally and and privately are people um are we making strides in in being more well-rounded people and i only ask that because if you look at the statistics on say mental health and suicide and those things it doesn't seem to be getting better so i guess my follow-up question is you know what are you doing to try and keep yourself strong and 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 i guess what gives you hope uh, I, I surround myself um, in environments that make me happy um, and family, family is big um, and I, I've never, never seen rugby as a job for me. I've, I've always seen, um, seen it as a, as a passionate hobby that I get paid for in some, sometimes um, and that's the career that I chose. Uh, so being in that environment, um, in the sporting environment, I guess, is, uh, is unique and it just offers um, different pathways and, and different avenues to meet different people all, mm. all around the world. So I think it's, I'm really passionate about people and um, I do like to create an environment where I can meet people, I can um, meet new people, I can travel and um, see new places. Um, so I guess that's my that's my comfort zone, um, but you know it's everybody's different. I guess um, uh, you talk about where we are as a people or where we are in the world. I think we're we're still very 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 slow at um, you know um, obviously with what what is going on with the with the race um, issues around the world. Um, there's, you know, there's all sorts of issues that, that we're just very slow at. Um, uh, sexism, uh, homophobia, um, all sorts of um, issues that I, I would have thought um, we would have gone a lot further down the track and, and been equal, and mm. and um, but but we're not. And that's that is sad. That is one sad thing that uh, I see with my niece and my friends' kids is that. Um, you know they're still having to look and deal with this, which our parents had to had to do the same. Mm. So, it's, um, yeah, I think just we're a very slow, slow human race. Hey, eh? we're we're not good at doing things properly, and um, uh, and that's why in a headspace for me, I do like to you know be close to my family, be surrounded by the friends that I that I have, and when I when I do have to work or work. Um, you know, I, I work in an industry that uh, that I'm passionate about and um, that I love, and um, yeah, that's that's and that's me, mate. I love it. I love it. So after the break, I want to talk to you a little bit about the things that you do surround yourself with. You're you're a, you're an enigma, Cam, because I I will call you every now and then, and we've been friends since school, and and you'll be up to something, and it's it, it's it, the funny thing for me is it always involves people, and it always involves dreaming big, and it is something if if people who are watching like I've seen that guy before. You were the main focus of the One More Win documentary, the Cook Island rugby documentary, which has played here on Audiana TV. And so I thought in the next segment, we'll talk a little bit uh, from, you know, your time. Um, well, I don't know what you did before the Blues. And then I know you did some stuff in Aussie and the Cooks and, 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 and well, the world is your oyster. So stay with us, team, and we're going to uh, dig into that mine of Cam Cougar right after this break. For those who don't know, Cam and I went to school uh, and we were good friends there and, and we're still pretty good friends now. I'd say 
throughout our 20s and 30s, we haven't seen a hell of a lot of each other because, you know, the babies and jobs and all the podcasts and, and life and paying bills, it, it gets in the way from just hanging out with your friends. But we do touch base from time to time. And, and, and uh, I'm always interested with Cam, your story, because you're always out there, you're always doing things. It involves people, it involves opportunity, it involves dreaming. And and you're and I don't know if you know this about yourself, but you give people this idea that you can dream. And maybe we'll revisit that because I'm fascinated with this. I think that we live in a time in history, you know, you mentioned your ancestry, and I and, and I did a post today about my ancestry, you know, from the Cook Islands, and nothing was guaranteed for them right like absolutely nothing not even dreaming and this is a huge thing that they offered us they offered us the capacity to dream the capacity to want more and it's a it's a, it's cool but it's a burden because it comes with risks it comes with trying things that are difficult and trying things that might not work so we acknowledge that but we carry on regardless because this was the point you carry on this is the hope in life so let's let, let's start after school, Cam. I, I want to know specifically about your. What did you do? What did you want to do straight after school? And what did you do? <laughs> um, well, I like that little I, laugh. That acknowledges <laughs> a <yeah>. bunch. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I I still uh, at that time um, probably wanted to play sport for New Zealand in some capacity. Um, and then when I figured out that I wasn't going to make it as a player, I thought, hey, there's other opportunities, uh, other avenues to, uh, to go down to, uh, to get in that sporting uh, environment. Um, I did, I, you know, it wasn't until I was 24, I guess, 23, 24, so that's quite a long time um, until I figured out that that's what I really want to do and I had an opportunity to, uh, to assist um, the super the blues super franchise in 0304 so that was quite cool for me they were winning uh, they? yeah they were they were that was a yeah that was a very star-studded team and one of my jobs was to look after a certain player called rupini thalthal and Buka. uh <laughs> roops he was the man he was a superstar back then and uh that was that was my one job really was to look after him and make sure he'd show up to training and <laughs> And uh, a couple of other funny stories around him, but um, what? Uh, but before you carry on, tell us about that story. Where can you tell us about that story where you were flown to Fiji? Oh yes, yeah. So this was uh, pre-season uh, Christmas uh, 03. Oh three. So, yeah, this was uh, the end of 03. and um, I was uh, called over by the coach Peter Sloan and the manager Ant Strawn. And they said to me, oh, Cam, what are you up to this weekend? And I go, oh, I'm off to a 21st. Yeah, looking forward to it. And they go, no, you're not. You're flying out to Fiji with uh, Rupiti Thalthal for three days just to make sure he he came back. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. That sounds quite cool. But then then you hear all the stories about Roops, how he would go off to Fiji and not come back. And then then it gets worse. It's a three-hour – oh, sorry, it's a three, uh, three flights and a two-and-a-half-hour drive to his village. So here I am, um, early twenties, uh, jumping on a on a plane. Get, get you know, got treated like kings. Definitely, because Rupini was uh, was huge back then. And uh, we took three flights, and then we had this two uh, two and a half hour drive on rocky roads to uh, to his village, and uh, treated really really nicely there. And but we're coming to the last day, so we're only there for a few days. And coming to the last day, and I have to. My one job is to bring him back, and if I don't bring him back, then I might as well just stay in Fiji too. <laughs> so we 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 get up, and I'm nervous, and I wake him up, and he goes, "Nah, don't worry about it. We'll we'll get there in time." And we finally took off. We uh, missed one of our flights, uh, so that was quite nerve wracking. But we managed to get another flight, uh, land into Auckland Airport, and I get a phone call from Ant, the manager, and it was Cam. Have you got him? Yes, and then he just hung up. Job, job done. So it wasn't even how was the trip. It was, is he there? Is he with you? Yes. So that was uh, that was a cool story about uh, Rupini. But um, yeah, he was the man. He's an awesome player, and yeah. So he's uh, that was. Um, I sort of knew then. I guess that that was my passion to to look after people, and and that's what management, sports management, is about. Is it's about looking after people and looking after the players that you're that are under your under your team and you've um, 
yeah, it's a it's a cool job. And but and yeah, twenties, mid twenties, I guess. What was it? What was it like? Kind of seeing our superheroes as just people. What were they like with you? I mean, are these confident people? Are they people who have everything together? I mean, I assume they're just humans. But what must it be like being, you know, the person on everyone's mind? Yeah, well, Carlos Spencer was, uh, yeah, he was a superstar uh, in our in our team and ar- around the world. He was, you know, Carlos Spencer far out. And I, I've only, I'd never met him before. And I thought, oh, you know, you look at him and you think, oh, he's a superstar, must be a little bit arrogant. And and then you get to meet him and get to know the person, and he's a fantastic person and mm-hmm. works really hard, loves his family, um, and he's a really down to earth guy. And mm-hmm. now they treated me like. Yeah, you know, I, I I was in charge of the clothing and, and in charge of getting all the lunch every day, so they treated me really well. They had to, they had to. But no, nah, they're really really good people. But that and and that's the thing about my industry is you know you uh, you you're meeting your heroes and you're meeting superstars and people that you you think are untouchable, but mm. you, you're coming face to face with them. It's like when I met. Um, I met Jonah Lamu once. That was quite cool. And Dan Carter, when I first met Dan Carter, or um, Richie McCaw. Um, you know, there's yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing uh, uh, time when you work work with these people. And uh, uh, but the, yeah, everyone's a human. Everybody has their ups and downs. Everybody, you know, gets a a, a speeding ticket. Everybody uh, runs out of petrol every so often. Mm. You know, everybody loses their khaki. So I mean, that's just. They're all human beings at the end of the day. But not everyone has a Cam Kilgar next to them making sure they get back on the plane, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's, yeah. I love that story then and I love that we've immortalized it now because, look, we also live in a fast-paced world, Cam, where stories don't last forever. It's like they're, they're in and they're out. You're yesterday's news. And I think, you know, what's interesting for me is that I, yes, I agree with part of that, but it's also some of the most fun you have with people is cracking up about how things were or bonding over the tough times, you know, and there's something psychological too about, you know, if you think about some of the challenges you've had in life, hopefully some of them you remember with a different lens. They teach you a lesson or you can have a giggle about the time the car broke down or it you know it nearly didn't go right i guess the realities though is that in the moment it can be hard to see forward right and 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 to know that there will be i guess opportunity so just before we go to the break and we come back cam you know there's a rocky there's an idea i have in my head like the rocky moment you know where it's supposed to go all good there's the freeze frame at the end you're one did you think just quickly that you know you'd made it into the blues team you were being mentored was that going to be like in your mind had you skipped forward to all black manager and all those things oh most definitely yeah i I didn't know that was a career until i got into it and then yeah you're right i thought what's next for me all blacks or you know i did i had big big dreams and goals and Mm. um i set set huge goals as i as you tell other people to do most definitely yeah i I did you know you're the best around it's the rocky uh rocky theme song that's right but um i think i i I probably the problem is i think i probably did watch too many um sporting movies you know this summer i watched far too many sporting movies and thought and and maybe that's uh that just blinded myself and, and and it's the reason why i um why i always set big goals and and you know i don't always reach them i I, you know probably out of five goals i probably only get one or two but you know that's just what i do i just Mm. uh like to make it a challenge well we're going to keep going on uh back into this point just in a second So, Cam, we were talking about goals and setting big goals, and I learned something uh, recently from neurology, which is about the that that we have trained ourselves to get this dopamine hit, you know, the reward from the brain when we get to the destination. It's something like waiting for the new iPhone and all these things. And if you you that's a that's a kind of self self loathing way to live because the the true 
hit you should get from your mind and your brain as a reward is the journey and so you've got to train yourself to enjoy the process not just look for the destination and it's a challenge to do that because in the moment we referred to it before you are just trying to make it work you're trying to swim you know your legs are going fast under the water and up above you're just trying to be you know the swan or whatever the metaphor is but but I think that's the lesson I'm trying to take in as I as I get a little bit older is like there's no plan B here really. Uh, COVID reminded us of just our vulnerability to everything and, and that it is now to follow those dreams you know and and I guess I want to know like what happened after the blues and as we kind of transition forward to because because the next big dream was the Cook Island rugby team job where you were tasked to you know basically well do a lot but to get these guys into the world cup so so just quickly uh what happened with the blues did it end or were you kind yeah, of yeah i i was i I'd sort of finished helping uh ant um and then i i shot off to australia i went to sydney and brisbane and and uh, managed some club club rugby there um and then i came back to new zealand and i was the rugby manager of South Canterbury in the Crusaders environment. So I was down there for four years to, in, in Timaru. Really, really loved that. And then an yeah, opportunity to, to um, a very difficult voluntary opportunity came up with the Cook Islands to uh, manage the 15s team. How did so, that come um, up? Oh, I just, uh, there's a there's a Cook Islander down in, uh, down in Timaru. And he, one. He showed, <laughs> showed one, one Cook Islander. Yeah, no, he showed me the... Um, showed me a job opportunity and and a uh so i decided to take it and um it would also meant that i could move back up to auckland and mm-hmm. see my family and um i didn't know how challenging it was and to be fair this started a big part of my depression was the fact that i was going to come back come back up to auckland have no income um and really struggle for four years four mm-hmm. or five years so mm-hmm. It was the start of a, a really high point, but it was also a very, very start of a very, very low point for me in my life. Um, I was promised a few things, not not by the Cook Islanders, but by other um, club opportunities in Auckland that that uh, that was sort of false promises, unfortunately. And um, yeah, I had to delve into my savings, and financially, I got depressed, which which happens, you know, mm. the financial side to depression and. Um, and it was a real struggle. I, uh, I was doing my Cook Islands work for free, and, and that's what you do because they have no support from World Rugby. They're, they're a t- Tier 3 nation, so they get no support from World Rugby. Um, they get they get $70,000 uh, 70, um, pounds a year compared to for instance, the All Blacks and South Africans and a couple of other Tier One nations—they got fifteen million dollars uh, a, a month or so ago. So that's the difference between a Tier One and a Tier Three nation is huge. Mm. So I was doing that. I, I, I wanted to do it. I, I had the passion, and you know, the Cook Island people are great people, and um, and we went on a tour. I did my first ever international team management tour to Papua New Guinea. Well, run us through that because that would have, that was the spark of the beginning, right? Like Cook Island rugby was, that was not supposed to, what you won over there, right? We did, yeah. We we played three tests. It was the Oceania Cup and uh, we had to play Tahiti, Solomon Islands and the host Papua New Guinea in the final uh, as well. And we won all three of them, which was fantastic. And it was a, it was the most challenging tour that I've ever, ever come across. But I've been to, you know, tours where you're in Hong Kong and in Scotland, six star hotels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that Papua New Guinea Port Moresby trip will be the, the tour that I um, remember the most, and, I, and I, I really enjoyed it. And it was my first ever international team management um, challenge, and uh, it was cool looking after a group of lads taking them over to Port Moresby, one of the you know, second or third most unsafe places in the world, um, <laughs> and, to, and to come out on top. And that was that was really cool. And, the, and it was great for the, 
the rugby community and the Cook Islands, and it was just good for good for the players. And it, it wasn't easy. It, it was definitely not easy. There were a hell of a lot of challenges, and um, but uh, you know that's that's what I that's what I do, mate. I, mm. I like to um, I like to surround myself with very very good people, which the Cook Island players and the Cook Island um, community were, and and that was great for me. And I had really good support from my family. That that mm. that, that was the only way I got through really because I had great support from my family and and um, and uh, yeah I ended up in hospital after the tour and there was all sorts of stuff that, that didn't go well for me um, but I kept in there and, and uh, as you know with that movie One More Win we, we needed to work, beat one more country to get to a Rugby World Cup um, the, the only problem was it was Fiji a, mm. a stacked Fiji team and again, um, Fiji were a tier two nation, so you know financially they get well supported. They had four or five test matches to lead into this one one game, and, and we had a we had a game against Thames Valley and a and a game against Blues Development in the middle of winter in, in Auckland, and then to travel to I mean there were just so many challenges. Um, it, it, it's we, we had the David and Goliath story thrown around us all the time but it was worse than the david and goliath story i mean um david he threw the rock i think that was right i think he had the rock i mean we didn't even the cook islands we didn't even have a rock <laughs> so it was like taking on goliath or the jandal uh, naholo naholo the fiji winger captain at the time um with with nothing and we 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 never we never gave up but to be fair it was um, a real struggle for me mentally. I was, you know, I was on daily med- medication then because I was um, in a really bad place. And pl- our players were amateur. Some players lost their jobs because they had to give up work to go on the tour. Mm. You know, families. It was tough on families. Um, the Cook Island community in New Zealand gave all they could. Yeah, you know they. They gave money to us to get there and, and they fed us and they put jerseys on us and they they looked after us. Uh, and that's why I would never turn my back on the Cook Island people or the, or the Pacific Island people because even the Fijians, who I wanted to hate because they beat us and they went to the World Cup, they were so nice to us. They, mm. they knew the challenges. And, and Naholo at the time put a tweet saying, Get off your get off your world rugby and support Cook Islands rugby. They need your help. They cannot. The, 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 the Fijians just smashed us by a hundred points, but you know they were so nice to us after, and they just they know the challenges because they see it on a on a bigger scale, I guess. But but yeah, for, for t- there's no growth. There's no growth in world rugby. There's no. Um, it's like yeah, you're either tier one or tier two. Uh, you get looked after. Everybody else, that's it. Um, mm. and, and I understand a bit it's hard because there's lots of countries around the world but yeah I, I I focused on a goal and a dream to get the smallest one of the smallest countries in the world to a rugby world cup and people were probably telling me to my face that it was not going to happen but you know because you watch so many movies and you see so many cool stories about the underdog beating the top dog that you think but my might just happen. Mm. I didn't swear before. I didn't swear then. Um, you can <laughs> you can bleep that out. But I can bleep you, that you out. Could, yeah, but you you know I I just afterwards I remember talking to the to the doco crew about um, what what happens after and and it it, it sort of it, it's it at the end. You know you lose. We all go back and try to find a job or or go into a job. And they go on to the World Cup, and, and that's it. And um, you know, I, I I was I really struggled after that. And then I, but I stuck with it. We we had another shot, um, even more challenging circumstances down the track. And I, I just, yeah, I just I, I probably got addicted to trying to get this one of the smallest countries to a rugby World Cup. It was just um, it took a hell of a lot out of me, eh? uh, mentally, physically. Uh, emotionally it took a hell of a lot out of me mm. but um 
Yeah. Well, let me tell you something about storytelling because the story's not over and that's worth hanging around for, right? And you have hung around. And I mean that physically, mentally, emotionally because, you know, <laughs> we say follow your dreams, but we don't really realize that the opposite to dreams is nightmares. And this is the risk, but the reward is still there because here's what I think happens. You mentioned the culture and the willingness to be open and this battle, this eternal battle, right, that goes back in time to history, to 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 people uh, wanting more for their futures. And I think this has built in you. And I think that's why it's so interesting when we come back to talk about that, because the story is not over for you, Cam. And this is the eve when we are recording this of some pretty big amazing things on the horizon and and i think this is the true goliath right this is a massive task that is coming and uh, i encourage everyone to just hang around for a bit longer because i'm going to prompt you on some pretty big things that have to do with your entire story so far We'd done a bit with the Blues, went to Aussie, went to Timaru, came back to Auckland, took on this Cook Island juggernaut, this world rugby, you know, the dream. And and look, if I'm transparent, I called the producers, Scott, Greg, Andy, and I said, this is happening and we've got to capture this. And they were, they were in. And so there is something to the dream cam, okay? It is okay that it didn't happen because I guess what's more important for humanity is the capacity to dream. It's what I talked about at the beginning. It's what I still talk about today because when it's all said and done, Cam, that's really all we've got, right? It's it's talk about our ancestors, talk about when life was full of no choices only some years ago. And for many of the world's population, it still is no choices, so what do you do? You are only by yourself. You are only potentially have the capacity to to go within. And I think it's a marvelous tool to be to be forced to look at, you know, life and say, man, you're too much today. So we do need that. We need the dreamers, Cam. And I'm a dreamer too. And I, I feed off hearing your stories and, and you know, that your willingness to uh, stand up to life every single day. So, you know, I'm just saying it gets noted and it gets recorded because I tell you who I'm not talking to tonight is Naholo, right? I'm not interested. Great, you won against the Cook Islanders. But I'm, I'm interested in, in you and the rest of the team trying. And I think that's informed a pretty big move in your life. So tell me about America and tell me, well, first of all, tell me, you know, when I messaged you the other day, do you want to come on the podcast? You're like, hey, man, I'm just about off to the States. I'm, I'm going to meet uh, the team associated with Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch and all of that stuff. What the heck? Yeah, so like you know, like we always talk about, you have the ups and downs. So I did. I got through, uh, and then yeah, uh, before Christmas, um, I got uh, connected to a, a, a multi-millionaire who's now a billionaire. Uh, his his name is Adam Gilchrist, and he's not the cricketer, but he's a uh, the owner of F Forty Five uh, Gym, a global gym. Him and him and uh, Mark Wahlberg, the actor. So. What's happened is that they, he's bought a rugby team. Uh, so he flew me up to the States and, and yeah, my life had definitely changed. You know, I was left, left on the plane, turning left on the plane to the bigger seats and um, staying in nice hotels. And just, it was a, yeah, I'd, I'd, it reminded me of Shawshank Redemption, you know, <laughs> being through the, uh, swam out the, the sewer and, and here I was. And, um, <laughs> Chucked on my new suit, and uh, uh, and he bought the Austin franchise too in this MLR Major League Rugby uh, competition in the states, which was into the third year uh, this year, 2020. So uh, I went up there, set up the LA team, uh, helped uh, turn around the Austin team, and my in the back of my mind uh, was the Pacific uh, Pacific team or the Hawaiian team. 
uh, because, you know, the Pacific is, is my passion and, um, and, and Hawaii is the gateway to rugby success for North America, for, for, for the USA, um, and for Canada too, but definitely for the USA. So, uh, opportunity came up with, with, uh, when, um, COVID-19 took over, um, LA was entering Dallas. There's a team from Dallas too, uh, which is partly owned by uh, Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks. He's he's brought into the rugby game as well. He loves rugby, so so here's an opportunity to get a, a Hawaii team, a Hawaii rugby team, a professional Pacific Island rugby team, the first ever professional Pacific Island rugby team into this MLR. And, and also the good thing about Hawaii is the location of Hawaii um, and the real estate of Hawaii. It's, it, it could either it could either be playing in Super Rugby in five or ten years' time, or it could be in the Japanese league in five years' time. So it's just a perfect opportunity for a professional franchise to to start up in Hawaii. And again, it's a challenge. Like there's no professional sports teams in Hawaii. There's no NBA team. There's no NFL team. They have a very good uh, uni- university NFL team, uh, university American football team. Um, but here's this Pacific Island. Uh, you know, this is the top of the Pacific Island. This is huge. This is rugby talent is there, sports talent, great people. And here's an opportunity to get a professional Pacific Island team. So we, I got a couple of people involved uh, who I'm very close with and, and who, who work who have worked with New Zealand rugby and worked with a few other organizations and sport. And, um, and they were, they were right on it, right from the get go. So we've been working behind the scenes for a number of, number of weeks, well, a couple of months, three or four months now. Um, and we managed to get the first sign off by MLR to say, look, yep, you've got the right people. You've got, you're connected to the community. you you're looking at facilities. You've got Hawaii University on board as a training base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Hawaii Airlines, uh, the Hawaii government, and and yeah, we, we really want you to be a part of this tournament. And and same same with the other teams. You know, there's there's a lot of teams on the East Coast, um, New York uh, and Toronto, for instance, who have to travel. They'll have to travel the furthest to to get to us. Uh, but they, they're all for it. Everybody wants to see this Hawaii team succeed. So it's really exciting. Um, you know, we've, we're talking to a number of players already, uh, just friendly chats, just to say that, yeah, we, this is for real. We, this, this, this is going to happen. Um, and Hawaii offers so much more than sun and surf and white sand and cool people. It just, it's the real, Pacific. It's the it's where the Pacific started from. It's uh, and a lot of people, Pacific Islanders, New Zealanders, they want to go back to that. They want to with what's going on in the world and what's happened down in Christchurch and with what what's starting to take over more is is suffering. So to give back to the game and to to bring their family to to Hawaii and be a part of a, a real family community type professional rugby club is just too good of an opportunity to give up. Um, sorry, that's a train going past my house. If you if you can hear that, but um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's really exciting times, um, and to give local Hawaiians an opportunity to play professional rugby and to play in front of their families just means so much so uh we were we we just we we're so excited so mm. it, it, it does remind me of you know i started with the cook islands and did five or six years um of tough really really tough times and it's it's definitely given me tough skin and it's taught me a lot of lessons and and um it's meant that i can manage a hawaiian professional rugby team and and people will say oh well, you know you're a pakiha half Australian, but I'll tell them that, nah, I'm actually, I'm Cook Islander. I'm, you know, I've done five years with the Cooks. So I'm a true Pacific Island um, person and, and I love the Pacific Island way of life and, mm-hmm. and uh, what it means. And it really does mean community and family 
And um, that's so exciting. I just, this team is going to change the game. It's, it's, it's going to be big for world rugby because they have promised a professional Pacific Island team for years. Um, we're going to find a lot more journal Lomus. We're going to unearth a Michael Jordan of rugby and change the game in America. We're going to be the Chicago Bulls of, of rugby uh, and, and we are going to take rugby to the next step uh, with the people that we have on board and and the players that, that want to be a part of our setup. And and yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing. Like uh, the Michael Jordan doco that everybody's seen and everybody's talking about is that NBA wasn't that big when he first started. Um, and it was really him and that created such the buzz around the sport and and that's what pacific islanders have been doing in rugby since the beginning of time mm. i mean they are they are the sport the the way that they run with the ball in one hand and and throw the impossible pass or i always think about Ru penny scoring three awesome tries against the crusaders or a couple of tries in the 2003 world cup or Jonah Lomu, who, to be fair, is my, my favourite player of all time. He made rugby professional. He was the reason why rugby was professional. It was down to him. No one else. He ran over people. He scored tries from amazing parts of the field. He, he just, as a kid growing up watching Jonah Lomu, you're just so excited to know that he was playing and he was just so good for the game and and he was he's the reason why rugby is where it is today but we're going to take it to another level in memory of Jonah we're going to create this professional Pacific Island rugby team and just change the game um, we're going to have our struggles and it's not going to be easy but <laughs> when Cam Coolgar is involved it's never easy <laughs> that's, my, that's the name of my book well I'll tell so, you what I will remember that. That is the name of your book, and you write that book, okay? Promise me, because regardless what happens, Cam, you have all of us behind you, all yeah. right? And, have and a picture of you scoring that try, yeah. lunchtime try. Just have a picture of me in the back, like, hmm. No, 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 no. <laughs> because because you mentioned before meeting your heroes, and it's funny because you know you you are one of my heroes, you know. And I know we're funny as blokes and all of that stuff to not talk like that, but I tell you, bro, it takes some kahunas to get back up and do this and 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 so you you should know that we are all behind you as are all the people who are, are with you and actually you don't need that because regardless what happens cam you know the process there's there's hurt there's pain if it doesn't go your way and most likely things always don't turn out exactly but there is these diamonds and it's just important to look for them you know but but that's why i think it's it's not, I think obviously you've done your work and it's going to happen. That doesn't mitigate any of the hard work that comes and the stresses and all these other things. Because when you try and trail plays, you've literally got to cut down the bush along the way, you know? And that doesn't suit people who don't like bush cutting. And that doesn't suit people who are trying to do it too. And politics. And yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pl people in New Zealand who are, are surprisingly not on your side because this is looking outside the box. And and look, I do know that we're funny creatures, but, but you go, Cam, and, and you paved this way because you uh, are involved in, in, in the dream. And that's that's that. Okay. That's that. And there's, there's those of us, I've thought about this a lot, there's those of us in life who all, we all have to play a role, you know, there's the court jester in the, in the community, there's the old weird uncle, there's the this and there's the that, and there's the dreamer, and Cam, you got to do it, okay, because uh, you cheers, give brother. permission you, for buddy. everyone else to try, and if we don't have that permission, the world can swallow us up very quickly, so, so you should know that. Cam, I want to thank you for taking us on a little journey on Please Blow My Mind. We are out of time. Uh, uh, editor Clem down at Audiana TV will be saying, come on, man, wrap it up. We've got, a, we've got some more cool Pacific content to get to, um, but I want to thank you. Uh, where can people follow you if they want to just follow this journey? You've got a, a couple huge days. I know you do a bit of uh, gramming. Yeah, uh, Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Cam underscore Kilgore. But our um, team name, um, Kanaloa Hawaii, we do have a website up and running uh, where they can follow the journey. 
um, and, and Kanaloa, uh, to those who don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a god of the sea, god of the ocean, one of the gods. And, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's what, what the Pacific people are all about. You know, they, they, they were the first people to travel around the world. Mm. Um, so this is the start of, of something huge. So yeah, just, just follow Kanaloa, Hawaii rugby. Look it up. Awesome. Cam, one last thing. Uh, I try and think of practical things to pass on to the audience. And if there was one tool or mindset tip or thing you do during the day that, you know, I've kind of started to frame up as a primal secret, you know, something that is that is powerful, that can that can feed you when you are at the, the low points, that can motivate you when you're at the high points to keep you in line. Is there a ritual or or something that you do just to kind of, uh, I guess, um, give yourself the the most you can with the with the minimum amount? Yeah, ah, for sure. I think uh, a lot of people say things, but for me, when I'm at my my lowest. Um, I, I ring a brother or a good good friend like yourself a true brother and within a couple of seconds on the phone call I'm laughing because of old stories or reminiscing it's all right to remember the past um, because that will definitely determine and help your future um, but it is so important to talk to people like talking to people is the key even if you don't have someone to talk to go find someone a homeless person because they're really cool to talk to too sit down and ask them how they're feeling or just talk to people it's so so good for you you need to talk it's 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 the key and it's uh mm-hmm. the way forward so whenever you're in your deepest low just remember that, that there's someone out there that wants to talk to you as well so um find somebody and talk to them and uh like like having you willie it's it's been great for me so um the man. Oh, I love you, brother. Okay, we've recorded it. We've done our job. I look forward to many more conversations like this in the future. Um, Cam Cougar, thank you for blowing our minds, my brother. Thank you. Thank you.